In my opening lectures on the Industrial Revolution, I talked about the great divergence between Western Europe and the rest of the world during the first Industrial Revolution. Do you remember what I meant by the great divergence? Well, up until 1750 or even later, Europe's economy did not look that different from the economy of the rest of the world. And an argument could be made that India and China were more economically advanced. For the next 200 years, Europe and the United States would take a commanding lead. And for the period from about 1820 to 1920, England would be way ahead of the other European powers. Why? Actually, you're going to have to tell me. Specifically, in your next class, you're going to write a one-paragraph essay answering the question, why did England lead the Industrial Revolution? In your essay, I want you to give three reasons why England took the lead, and I want you to support these reasons with specific evidence from the charts, graphs, and images in your notes, templates, and my lectures. What do I mean by specific evidence? I mean I want you to use actual numbers, actual information from the charts, or actual description of other visuals. We'll see a few more in this lecture. And I want you to explain why this evidence, why these numbers, why these paintings support your claim about why England took the lead. Let me just note that this kind of writing, making an argument, making a case, and supporting it with facts and figures is actually the kind of writing you're most likely to be asked to do for some future employer. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a lot of help putting together an answer starting here. You saw this map and graph before. Together, they give one explanation for England taking the lead, which is Britain had lots of coal, and it could get to that coal easily and cheaply. Think about how the map and chart offer support for this statement, and remember, be specific. So you see that major industrial cities grew up near coal fields, and you, on your other notes template, you actually have statistics about how quickly those uh, cities grew, and you see that coal was particularly inexpensive in the one English city listed here, which is Newcastle. The, this graph suggests another reason why England took the lead in the industrial race. So what do we learn from this graph? we learn that England had much higher wages measured in the silver it took to pay those wages. So what difference did that make? Well, English manufacturers had an incentive to find labor-saving devices. These manufacturers discovered that by applying energy, that is, coal-fired steam, to machines that produced more work product much more quickly they could reduce the cost of the goods they produced. More goods at cheaper prices meant people could buy more stuff. So let's go back to our Crash Course History Guy and see what he has to say about these two reasons for England's Industrial Revolution leadership. As you probably gathered from my first Industrial Revolution lectures and this review, I agree with both of the Crash Course Guy's points. But I think there are some other explanations for why Britain took the lead. And you just heard our crash course guy throw out one of the answers in a single word that he didn't really explain. And that word was capital. So what is capital? Basically, it's investment in machinery or in new ideas or even in improving human productivity. So economists actually refer to education as an investment in human capital. So that makes Ms. Jacobs and me serious capitalists, right? any rate, during the first Industrial Revolution, England was world headquarters for capitalism. So let's look at another part of the crash course in world history. This time it's capitalism as the subject. Okay, I kind of like this guy, but he talks way too fast. So, let's go back and review some of what he said and find more support for his arguments. First, let me try to simplify his definition a little. Capitalism basically is investment that expands production. In a few years, 
actually during the period that we talk about as the early industrial revolution in the 1840s, Karl Marx would write that only labor created economic value. That turned out to be a hard statement to defend when one work, woman working a power loom could produce 500 times more cloth than one woman working a, machine, uh, a hand loom. The woman was labor and the loom was capital. So why was Britain capitalism's world headquarters? Well, one reason our crash course guy gives is that Britain dominated world trade. It dominated world trade because it had colonies all over the world to trade with and to provide raw materials. And even more, it dominated world trade because its military and merchant navy dominated the seas. The chart is a little hard to read, sorry. But here are the facts, if you might want to write this down, if this is one of the points you want to make in your essay. In 1570, British ships moved about 50,000 tons of product a year. And note that France and the Netherlands were both much more important maritime powers. 200 years later, British ships moved a million tons a year and nobody else came close. Note that I've underlined that million in red. So let's hear a brief chorus from Rule Britannia arguably England's national anthem, or at least military anthem. It's all about Britain's control of the seas, or as the song calls it, the Azure Main. Another reason for England's industrial leadership that the Crash Course Guy talks about was an agricultural revolution. There was better management of crops and technological improvements, and both increased the production of food and decreased the number of workers that were needed to raise food. This freed up a labor force for manufacturing production and helped drive population increase. More food almost always in human history means more people, and this in turn led to more production as well. Sorry, I could not find a simpler or better labeled version of this important chart. So what do you see on the Y or vertical axis is the number of bushels of grain that one worker could produce on one acre. Note that it goes from about 55 bushels in 1600 to around 130 in 1900. I don't actually know why there seems to be a slight uh, decrease between 1500 and 1600. It may be related to the plague. At any rate, this means that one worker by 1900 is providing two and a half times more food than in around 1600. But as the crash course guy correctly notes, this came at a human price. A lot of the improved productivity came from combining tiny little agricultural plots into bigger farms owned by bigger and more prosperous farmers and ending small farmers' rights to graze their animals on land owned by the whole village. This is actually called the enclosure movement. At any rate, lots of these small farmers became landless laborers. Many of them, by the way, uh, left for America, uh, where they helped populate uh, the new country. But it also created more workers willing to take those not especially pleasant factory jobs. Something the crash course guy did not mention, but should have in my mind, was that scientific revolution and the Enlightenment really took hold in England. This is a painting from 1763. Let's go back to one of our earlier videos and listen to a discussion about the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment in England and what this painting tells us about it. This painting, by the way, would count as evidence for your essay, but you'd have to explain what it's showing. So pay special attention to the way ideas were freely exchanged in England. This is a picture of people meeting at a coffee house, which was actually another a new British invention. So I know you are missing charts, right? Here is a chart of patents in England. Do you know what a patent is? It's a claim to have invented something filed with the government. You have to file technical papers showing the invention. And this gives the inventor the right to the profits from that invention for a number of years. 
Obviously, this creates an incentive to come up with new inventions. And what we see here is that scientific invention was skyrocketing in England. Again, specific report, uh, evidence, if you're going to use this in your essay, say what you see in the chart and use numbers. The crash course guide does make the point that England's government was friendlier to capital investment and to industrial development than most other countries. I don't think he explained this point very well. What I would say is that Parliament insisted on a reasonable level of taxes collected reliably. Parliament did not let kings bankrupt the country, Louis XIV style. And finally, Parliament passed laws that encouraged investment. England also created a strong banking system with financial institutions that let smart but poor investors like Samuel Arkwright or James Watt raise the money they needed to turn their ideas into actual production. So let's return to our video about the Industrial Revolution in England. We've talked a lot about production. But capitalists and industrialists would not have made money if no one bought what they were producing. Fortunately, all this new wealth, this new gross domestic product that the Industrial Revolution was creating meant that a lot of people had more money to spend and they had a lot more things to spend it on. Let's watch one last clip about the Industrial Revolution in Britain. The narrator uses these two paintings to tell the story of the change in consumption. You could use these paintings in your essay as well, again, if you explain what they show. I look forward to reading your essays.